Good day, everyone. And I am Maurice Coleman. I'm Paul Signorelli. I want to welcome you to the Information Gone Wild podcast brought to you by San Jose State University's iSchool. In this podcast, we discuss all things information science with our noted guests. And today, we're fortunate to have with us Patty Wong, City Librarian at the Santa Clara City Library in California. Patty was the president of the American Library Association for the 2021-2022 <clears throat> term and was the first Asian American president of ALA. She has been on the f- faculty at San Jose State University's iSchool, a wonderful iSchool, thank you, teaching subjects such as equitable access to library services, library management, grant writing, and library services to young people. Welcome, Patty. We're just delighted to have you here. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Patty, our very first question <laughs> is our warm-up question to get your juices yes. flowing, get your yes. brain working. What brings you happiness? Thank you, Maurice, for that question. Um, making a difference, um, improving someone's life, sharing a skill. I love learning about um, someone else's culture, their background, uh, um, their thinking process. Um, I'm a very intellectually curious person. So I love learning something and getting to know other people better, um, especially a new recipe or learning to cook. Taking that from happiness to uh, the topic that we're going to be addressing in large part today, how does happiness work its way into equity, diversity, and inclusion? How would you define that, Patty? You know, um, imagine a world in which everyone that uh, you knew, everyone around you, um, uh, where equity, diversity, and inclusion was not only the norm, but was um, expected, uh, where we recognize that we bring our own biases to the table, where where, um, where, uh, we can have conversations, um, even when we disagree about things, uh, to learn more about each other and and the world around us, and to value um, and expect uh, that people will value and that the work and the who you are is valuable to others. That is kind of the world that <clears throat> I tr- strive to live in all the time. And it, it brings me a lot of happiness and joy. I've done a lot of work around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Not only um, that it be part of the norms that we seek for our communities, uh, but that um, as a practice, we institutionalize that work in our in our policies and our procedures. Um, both formally and informally, where um, getting to know other people and what they value and and bring our own values to the table is part of everyday conversation. If you could imagine that kind of world where it's not full of strife, where we're interested in in, um, becoming stronger as a community, that's what I believe it brings, will bring about a lot of happiness. Patty, how do you quantify the value of the return on investment on diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, belonging, EDI plus DEI plus activities? Sure, sure. That's a great question, Maurice. And you know, um, when you talk about return on investment, um, I think the the things that you want to see are some outcomes and and how things change over time. Um, you know, I if if you could consider um, the work of EDI as a practice, I've been doing this my entire career, and and uh, presumably because I've had some really great uh, mentors in my life, including my parents, that it's been a lifelong kind of commitment to making sure that um, I treat everyone the way I would like to be treated, and and so on and so forth. When you talk about return on investment, you want to see some change. Um, so part of that is is under, having a full understanding of also what change management and change looks like and and how it takes time, practice, um, strong communication, um, active engagement, and also patience, um, <clears throat> flexibility, um, being able to uh, um, uh, be mindful of oneself as, as you bring yourself into the work. Um, 
and how you're changing as well. So when we talk about return on investments, we actually are hopefully see some substantive changes. For instance, I'll just give you pre some practical examples. Um, how I knew we were making a difference in some of the cities I've been working with is when my HR department says to me, you know, you've been doing some wonderful activity um, around uh, uh, interviewing and recruiting and um, and getting some uh, remarkable talent in, in terms of great pools of people, but but you're also doing it in a way that is both professional and in a formal setting, um, changing the way the culture is happening at the library. Can we use some of that language and include it in all of our recruitment brochures? That's a significant change. So <clears throat> Imagine, I will. I remember distinctly when I had this conversation with our HR director and she changed because we have been doing the work for so many years. She changed every single job description to, to have an equity statement um, included in every recruitment. They, um, they supported the ideas behind actively recruiting for language skills and uh, multi multicultural experience as additional um, uh, benefits that we were looking for in terms of the recruitment itself that wasn't you know thought of back then and and then they changed so that was a very small thing but it changed the entire culture of the entire city uh, <clears throat> and likewise you know my staff started in small ways to adapt some of that thinking in all the questions they wrote on the interview uh, panels. Uh, the makeup of the panels themselves changed. Um, how we see uh, uh, ROI take place is when you see changes in the policies and procedures of your institution, whether it's formal or informal, start to shift. Now we see lots of organizations, not just libraries, but libraries influence communities as a whole. And that's the kind of practice that we want to see. But but the other thing that's happening is we see entire municipal agencies starting to do policy audits and to look to see where there's barriers to access. That's the kind of shaping that the library as an institution can make um, as part of a larger community um, in, in practice. But those are just some small examples. But they have some meaningful impacts. And I, you know, even when we do, where we do job recruiting, um, the fact that um, when I was in Stockton, we went to um, our local churches and our communities of faith, because that's where we knew not only would we have communities um, who, who on the ground represented all of the communities in their broadest diversity possible, um, but we made an investment in our direct population that we cared about them and we wanted them to cultivate that relationship to grow them into library advocates and also library staff um, and volunteers and, and people that really continue to make a difference. So you'll see some incremental changes and then some larger changes as um, EDI becomes more of a presence and an expectation. There's so much to unpack in that. I just want to take a couple of things and bounce it back over to Maurice. but. You just mentioned the importance of uh, patience and professionalism mm -hmm. for our students and for the, your peers that are watching this. What can you guide them in terms of how you balance patience for the long term view with patience that actually holds you back because you're waiting so long for change to come? That's a really good question, Paul. You know, so um, I know that one of the things that I suggested that we talk about is um how do we manage and and progress in equity, diversity, inclusion when it is harder and harder to be openly equitable? And um, how difficult it's been um, because it's not so much <clears throat> that um, I'm not saying that intolerance is 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 taking a, a greater hold, um, but it's been been harder and harder to be able to. Um, to support um, equity wholesale, shall we say. And, um, and that's, you know, based a little bit on fear of retaliation um, and also people um, being uh, uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and I encourage all of anyone who's interested in doing the work. Remember, we all come higher hardwired. We have our own biases. We have our own way of um, being raised. We bring that with us every day to the workplace. And sometimes we have to unpack that and undo some of that, you know, the premises that we, we came up with, um, that we were raised with. Uh, and and recognize them for what they are. So we have to do our own internal work also. Um, and then when we come to the work, understanding that all of that has an influence and that we deliberately and strategically um, do something within ourselves to bring our best selves forward. Um, so that requires patience as well. But in terms of actually, so the work has to be done internally. How we do external work, and, and I am, I'm a strong believer that we need to do the work internally before we can do the external work well. Um, <clears throat> the external work takes time because change um, takes practice. It's like a yeah. muscle that you have to exercise all the yeah. time. And, and that means that you just need to engage and process and what works sometimes doesn't work all the time. What works for one community doesn't always work for another community, but you cannot be daunted by the initial reaction, which may be um, one of a little bit of skepticism. Sometimes it's overt, more overt than that. Um, and you need to keep on trying. It always helps if you have a buddy or a group of people to work with, because change is often difficult to do by yourself. Um, you need allies in the work. And once you find out um, who else is of um similar minds, similar concepts. It's working on different ways of reaching communities where they are, meeting them in that moment. Um, and that means you have to get to know them better. You cannot just come in and all of a sudden want change to happen. It takes practice. It takes energy. It takes positivity. It takes um, repetition. Um, and it takes learning from those things that were, aren't working to, to reach a place where mutual respect can take place. Um, and then the openness starts to happen. Um, there's going to be challenges along the way. Um, you know, it, one would not have thought, but, you know, in some communities, um, and I won't really name them, but when uh, when COVID happened and there was a lot of anti-Asian hate that was going on, um, I happened to be the director of one um, very strong positive library, um, but I got spat on at um, in my work. And I was called a lot of names, even in the building, mm. um, and not necessarily by staff, not that at all. Um, but I did have some staff who questioned um, a little bit. They they were they were you know. So what I think what what need, we need to remember is that um, sometimes old habits are hard to break, mm -hmm. and and we need to kind of rely upon um, the commonalities that we share as community. Um, in order to have stronger conversations about what makes us different and also what brings us together. Um, so the patience that I'm sharing with, with the team as a whole out there is really um, know that the resilience that you create, the work is powerful and impactful. And so don't let a few delays or, um, or uh, challenges prevent you from moving forward. One of the things I have a, a great colleague right now who happens to be my boss and um, my other boss before her actually had a very hard time with some of the work that I was doing around EDI and said, you know, we didn't hire you for that. And I said, that's very interesting because actually when I actually interviewed, that's precisely what I said I needed to do in order to thrive as a community member and actually as a leader <laughs> within the organization. And um, they thought it was very annoying as opposed to funny. And, um, and so now that I have a new person who the first time she met me, she said, you know what? I'm an ally in the work. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. And so we struck it up from then. And she, she and I talk about code switching all the time mm -hmm. because we need to work within an environment that is sometimes a little conservative, sometimes a little unpracticed, shall we mm -hmm. say, sometimes a little um, understanding that they are very well-intentioned, but sometimes the execution is not, doesn't always reveal that. And so uh, making sure that we, do the things that we need to do to practice. So internally as the library, uh, we encourage cultural programming. We encourage risks in, in doing that. We encourage partnering with organizations to make sure that we are authentic and respectful in the delivery 
of our services, that we're not second guessing, that we um, actively work with our community um, to go book buying and, and, and shopping for materials uh, to bring back to the community. Because that cultural resonance, that community engagement is so important. Um, and that's where we find some additional allies. Uh, you know, we didn't have uh, a person who had as much, um, for instance, we didn't have a person who was as, as adept in the Hindi language. We have a lot of Hindi um, speakers and, and readers. Um, so we asked community, can you help us um, take a, a quick look at what's available and, and help us select? And the and they did. And, you know, so our collections, our services um, need to be based on that, which we, which we feel is um, uh, culturally responsive mm -hmm. and a respectful formal professional manner. So that means that I pay attention to all the rules and regulations and the processes that we need to pay attention to. We, we, uh, but we treat everyone with respect. Um, my community here is 44% speaking Asian language community. That's a pretty large group. And then on top of that, we have a very large Spanish speaking community. It's fantastic. It's great. That's part of the reason why I wanted to come here is because it's so diverse in that in that, um, in that way. Um, but being mindful that we don't pit resources against each other mm -hmm. in terms of so that we celebrate, we memorialize, we um, engage, and, and then we have the dialogue. The dialogue also can be very difficult, which means um, I'll just I will name this this organization. When I was in Santa Monica, um, we had a race riot. I'll just Ooh. say it very out loud. And um, and uh, and it did not have a successful outcome for um, our community, especially when um, our PD was responded. And so many of our African-American um, community members, and there aren't that many in Santa Monica, but there were quite a few in the community at the time when there was strife, and it was particularly a response to um, the George Floyd uh, murders. Mm -hmm. And um, and as a result of that, the library knew that it had to do some healing in the community. So what did we do? I called uh, knowledgeable members of our community to actively engage them in some good conversation about what was going on mm -hmm. and why we had um, difficulty. And um, so the healing began. And um, But it started with our local community and us having a reflective conversation about why that was so harmful and why um, people were hurt and why the energy needed to change um, and why it needed, was so important that people start to talk. Because um, they they did it a little bit through books. We introduced it through bibliotherapy a little bit. And then we actually kind of broke the door open a little bit and, and had this harder conversation about race relations and equity and inclusion and what that meant. And did that mean everybody? And um, it, uh, so I think you have to find the space and the mm -hmm. moment and um, the process that is most uh, intrinsic to the work so you can make it sustainable, um, so you can create the change that you wish to see, um, and that you can continue to practice. Um, if you start off really strong, and then you get all this pushback, and then you push again, and then you get all this pushback again, it will be this expectation of defensiveness. Um, you need to find the right formula and it, do, it doesn't work the same way in every single community, but you have to find the willingness and the allies um, and the partners in the community uh, to make that difference with you. I, I just want to clarify something you mentioned. You mentioned code switching. Some people who are listening might not be familiar with the terminology. Could you give you know, the one sentence or two sentences about code switching? So um, how I interpret code switching is um, we we have every intention of sharing what we really mean, but sometimes we have to use words that actually um, are more palatable for the larger community to understand what we're saying. And so sometimes we adapt and adjust words uh, to, to better explain what we're trying to do. Um, we also use it as a way of education. Um, 
and, and vocabulary development so that people understand that that words are very strong in their in their purposefulness. Um, and um, but we switch them out a little bit um, sometimes to get to the root of something, uh, but in a way that is much more acceptable and practice to the larger community. Um, you know, some people may say that it's, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, some people may say that that's a way of backing out. But I think one of the things that we need to kind of remember is that um, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, no matter how you say it, DEI, EDI, um, the work is formidable and mm -hmm. and formative. And so, um, you know, that's, so I would say, you know, if people, when when people talk about the EDI work and they use the words that are highly charged critical race theory, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and they know the impact that it's going to have, that is a form of code switching that goes the other way, which is to, to try to, to um, uh, infuse uh, harm, mm -hmm. actually. Um, uh, what we try to do when we talk about it in a positive way is to create um, avenues for us to do the work in such a way, in a descriptive way, that actually allows us to practice without inflaming. Um, and I know that, you know, some people have lots of different derivations of all of those things. And mm -hmm. that's just the way that I, I use that terminology and, and in my practice as well. I appreciate that. When you talked about the Santa Monica race riot and mm -hmm. the aftermath and the healing you created, you talked uh, from a point of view of having a relationship with all these people. You built a relationship with them before yes. all this happened. Right. In some of your writings, you talk about some key traits of leadership, being brave, active listening, taking risks, and seeking coaching and mentoring in the right moments. What are some other ways to, that you define leadership in a library setting and a professional setting, et cetera, that our students and alumni could really sort of take a page from or seek those things out in other people? Thank you. Um, so I believe that um, uh, everyone can be a leader. I, I believe that we um, all lead from whichever place that we find ourselves in. Um, and that means that uh, whether we're um, a little bit introverted or extroverted, we find a time and a place where we can make a difference. And that's the stepping out and stepping up part of the process. Um, it also means that you bring other people along with you and uh, that you care about uh, people in the moment, that you're able to take responsibility and be responsive. Um, to the change that you see around you and that you um, respectfully respond. Um, it, one of the things that I, I get asked a lot of times is about executive leadership and, and how, you know, people think the word executive means that you have to be at a higher level. You have to have a title or, or you know, um, I'm a human being. That's my title. <laughs> that, that, that everyone um, has that opportunity to be in that moment um, an executive leader. And that means thinking about the totality of the situation. It means bringing your best self with you. It means mm -hmm. bringing others along. Um, it means building relationships um, that you know will be helpful um, in the moment. It means uh, not always necessarily being a teacher, but being an active learner and actually bringing all of those skill sets ahead. Um, I think one of the things that um, that students, current staff, future staff, um, they hear the word executive leadership and actually get a little scared about that. And what is meant by that is, is, is actually how can we as community um, imbue um, the strengths and the skills and the recognition of those strengths and skills and the voice um, of, of oneself to say things out loud that need to be said, to, um, to be part of the learning environment uh, that we want to create in a mm -hmm. positive way to move things forward um, and to take that risk and, and maybe being a little courageous um, to go outside of oneself to make those things happen, to, to work with allies and to find out who else um, is interested in doing the work with you. Um, leadership, um, 
sometimes comes to us when we least expect it. Uh, hmm. You know, it can be um, not everyone is called to it. Not everyone is recognized for it. Um, you know, a lot of the people that have mentored me in my life, actually, um, they recognize something in me that I didn't really see at all, mm -hmm. um, except that it was by happenstance or um, I said something out loud in a meeting or I volunteered for something or I um, just like our wonderful student assistant here, Caitlin, is assisting us. Those are all part of being um, a, a stronger community building um, individual. And that it takes all of us in order to make the world a better place. That's kind of the, you know, in a, in a nutshell, um, Ed, my thinking about leadership um, and that everyone has an opportunity. I will tell you part of that opportunity that I have as a director is I need to make sure that all of my staff are well-trained, that they have the resources they need, mm -hmm. that they have um, the support that is needed, and that it's all of our team. It's our volunteers. It's our custodial team. It's our security staff. It's um, all of our friends and our foundation members, and it's my team that 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 get paid, as well as the staff who are full time and part time. All of them need training, development, support, um, TLC. Um, they also need opportunities for wellness in mm -hmm. order to to make this a very holistic, um, well. Um, because so, our primary job is actually making sure that we provide the best service that we can to the community. And we can't do that well unless we have all of those things um, humming along. And the thread, I want to follow, lay a little groundwork here, that idea of serving the community and having so many different things. You've talked very nicely and eloquently about what leadership involves, which raises the question, as leaders of evolving organizations, which libraries continue to be, what is our main mission? We heard Dave Lankey's last month on our first podcast talk about libraries being a safe place for dangerous conversations. Kind of gets to what you were talking about in Santa, Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. We've seen over the years, Gina Millsap and um, David Lee King and Shawnee Topeka talking about community, our libraries being places where they facilitate conversations, not yes. just about the library, but the whole community. So if we're looking at students and our, our fellow practitioners out there, what is the role of libraries these days in terms of being part of the community and addressing the very issues that you're talking about? You know, um, a good friend of mine, Jim Neal, um, says to me all the time, libraries are not neutral. And he's absolutely right. Um, we have, I think, an obligation as a cultural institution to provide the knowledge base, the neutrality in terms of the landscape and the opportunity to bring um, all of those conversations together and to, to provide um, facilitation, um, space, engagement, uh, and even though, you know, and space, um, even though we might not necessarily always agree with the proponents using that space. Um, in order for us to, um, to be part of building stronger communities, that openness, the dialogue, the conversation that you mentioned um, has to be part of that. Um, that's how people learn. That's how people explore. That's how people try new ideas. And um, and there has to be an air of safety. Safety, not in terms of, um, well, physical safety, I suppose, too. But the safety in terms of the fostering of ideas um, and, and um, you know, uh, we we find ourselves in a in an interesting uh, world right now. Um, and in fact, you know, one of my colleagues um, visited me recently and um, said, you know, if we don't change the way we do things, the only thing that libraries are going to be known for is finding censorship. That's not necessarily a bad idea, but we are so much broader than just that. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, it's a rubric and a concept and a foundation upon which we um, pride ourselves on in terms of offering um, uh, the strongest array of materials that we can afford, because there is a resource um, uh, place around that. But I would say to the students and the listeners out there um, that libraries, um, as we're evolving, we have always actually been a place for um, for idea generation, for connecting, um, and and for dialogue, and and um, that whole commons 
uh, concept. Um, we did, we've always distributed materials, that is true. But part of the allure of libraries and why they're so important, not only today, but tomorrow and in the future, is the concept of the library is that third place. And I really do mean it as both a physical third place and also a virtual third place. Um, that concept is not, is, is, is very, you know, it's, it's a little bit, I guess, older in terms of identifying that, that concept of third place, but it's also still has the same meaning. It's just evolving in terms of what is expected now. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, you know, we provide any, anything from um, uh, presentations on STEM to being um, the meeting place. I'm going to have a meeting next week or two weeks, three weeks from now, um, Moms for Liberty is coming to, they borrowed our, our meeting room. You know, the dialogue that needs to happen um, uh, and, and the allowance for that exchange of ideas is, is imperative to um, our, our functioning as a community agency. Um, I'm in the middle of our strategic plan and we're also undergoing some good priorities thinking within our council um, right now. I want them to think about the library as that place where all of those things can happen, where, um, where community can find their voice, where community can engage, where different people of all different backgrounds can meet each other and learn about one another um, in, in a place that is um, uh, somewhat facilitated, but not necessarily, um, where they can provide a, an offer of an exchange of ideas um, from independent thinkers, um, but that we would provide uh, space, um, sometimes content, uh, but opportunity mm -hmm. to make that happen. I don't think, you know, I think if anything, when we say library as economic um, impactor, um, library as um, uh, community engager, library as community builder, those are all concepts that actually maybe libraries have tried on um, at different points in their evolution, but they still hold the same practice all the time, which is based on um, that connection with community and, and that wanting to, to make the world a better place. We used to have this concept that the library was the center of community. I, I'm hoping that we got away from that a little bit because we're not the center. We are we help facilitate. We mm -hmm. um, help bring ideas together. We um, uh, engage. And um, we're not the only agency that does that. We also need in common practice partners to help us um, reach more people. Um, if if someone were to just say to me, uh, what would a goal be for us? Where would my true happiness be? It would be really in reaching 100% of our users and actively engaging 100%, not just all users, all those people who are part of my community. Mm -hmm. I want not only all of them to get library cards, I want all of them to engage um, because the whole community gets better when that happens. Um, and our staff grow too because of that that interaction that happens. And so um, I know it may sound a little um, preachy, but if anything, um, uh, and I know I've gotten away a little bit from the context of your question, but I, I do think that we have um, that opportunity, but we also have that obligation. Patty, what's some practical tips for mm -hmm. anyone in the library? You mentioned, and you talked about the important people in the library. Uh, the facility folks, your frontline staff, your anyone who works with the public. What are some practical tips for them or those new to leadership positions or middle manager positions to help create that community of curious inquiry, intellectual inquiry that is so vital to the role you describe it of libraries now and in the future? Great question. Uh, you know, um, I think it goes back to um, creating a culture within our organizations where everyone is intellectually curious about the world we live in and how we can do a better job of fostering services and being a community driven organization. So um, that means looking at our data a little differently or, or more comprehensively. Um, it means working with um, our partners to garner some of that data and 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 to really apply that executive thinking from every position. Um, 
how our middle managers and our and our um, our uh, team that is responsible for supervision of that staff need to encourage uh, creativity. They need to encourage and give team members an opportunity to do outreach, um, uh, to get to meet community. One of the things that we do um, here in Santa Clara is we actually cross train almost at every level. And that's because we know that our resources are very precious. We've gone through a pretty um, tumultuous um, return to service. And that means that with limited resources, we just have to not only stretch people, we actually need um, uh, a cross section of our team to actually be interchangeable so that every staff person understands um, what the goals are and the roles that we play. And are, they're somewhat interchangeable. Not that they don't have specializations, they certainly do. And we want, always wanna make sure that we are mindful of their terrific talents and skill sets. Um, and especially, you know, um, working within um, a large uh, BIPOC community that we have here. Um, it does mean that um, we value that intellectual stimulation about learning more about one another's culture. The, the, it does mean that um, from um, the, the top leadership, we need that investment there, which means we need to have regular trainings. We need to have really good conversations about what we mean, about what the expectation of our staff um, truly means. It means that if staff come up with a new idea, let's explore that a little bit. Let's not damper it. Let's let's try to um, uh, to bring it up to light. It does mean that we have regular conversations with all staff at all staff meetings to encourage this. It does mean that we do a lot more communication so that the rumor mongering can be quelled to a dull roar. Right. Mm -hmm. It does mean that um, that we also need to make sure that we empower. Our, our middle managers to make good decisions about what not only the, the things that their staff um, come up with, um, but that they are active participants in the policy and procedural development. It does mean that we do policy audits and take a look and see where, where we have barriers to service. Um, mm -hmm. All of those things are, are important, um, but that we value all of the staff from, uh, from every position. And that means, um, uh, you know, that we care about them as human beings, that we also make sure that we listen to our um, uh, our middle managers when they say, oof, the staff are feeling a little stretched and a little stressed. We need to pay attention and we need to address that in the moment. Um, I've asked for um, permission. I'm fairly new at my position here. Um, I've asked permission for a couple of closed days for staff so that we can reinvest in the team. Um, and so they um, not only the team feels um, the energy around training and um, development, um, but that we care about them as 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 staff. And um, so we do we do our best to advocate. Um, not too long ago, we got bilingual pay um, for all of our team members that are. Um, it wasn't available to everybody. I'm not sure why. It doesn't really matter what happened before. What matters going forward is that we treat our staff with the same applications of equity, diversity, and inclusion that we expect for our entire community. And that means that, you know, they're paid well, um, they um, that they're not on the desk for inordinate amounts of time, that we have rotations, that we give them learning opportunities, that we give them leadership opportunities where they can um, do some uh, community outreach and um, maybe are in charge of a project um, mm -hmm. under the leadership of other people. Um, uh, one of the grants that my one of my team members, uh, two of them just wrote, and I'm so proud of them um, through the State Library, is a new way for us to do outreach. Um, uh, we presuppose, I think in library world, um, a lot about the community that we work with, but we really don't know them as well sometimes. And so if we come already prepared with a ton of programming, when we really haven't gotten to know them better, their demographics, getting to know um, so we're working with this, a, a very large apartment complex of, of community members, um, the majority of whom um, are Spanish speakers. Um, it, you know, you can tell by the number of, of um, cars that are parked around there that there are many people living in those households, many. And that means that there's overcrowding, there's not as much resources. 
When you do the analysis a little bit further, you find out that grocery stores are very expensive there. So they have to go far to get, so there's a, there's a, um, uh, there's a food desert there. There are all kinds of implications about what service would mean. And so our coming in with library service isn't the first thing on their list. So how do we expose them to other resources that are probably within maybe a short amount of time walking distance? Because they also have transportation needs that are not being filled there too. So we need to pay attention to the whole person. And I know that's a long-winded way of saying that actually um, we look around at our environment, we uh, assess what's needed, we bring our team along, we engage them and talk about expectations that we have, not for numbers. This isn't about numbers, this is about impact. How can we create outcomes where community um, benefits, um, even if we don't know them as well, and how to get to know them better? Um, and to in, in, um, infuse that same curiosity um, and applications uh, throughout the entire organization, which means um, having good conversations about our, our man with our managers about how they would like to approach this this um, mm -hmm. uh, this work and what kind of ideas they have. Um, it's not all about top down. It's how do we spread out? How do we make this a much more organic? thinking, learning organization. You have spent so much time talking about the importance of people, training your staff, having people get comfortable with each other, having those difficult conversations for our students and for our peers. As we talk about the essence of our work these days and for the foreseeable future, what would you suggest in terms of that balance of we have to report how many books we circulated, how many programs we had, but the other more important side of how were people actually affected and, and served? And can you do that by illustrating with a story about one of your favorite memories of working with a patron in your career? Keep it on the people side here, the real impact of the work we do. So um, I will tell you something that I, I failed at. And I think that's an important um, distinction. And you should encourage all of you wonderful listeners out there to ask someone you know who, who maybe you know, you're thinking, Oh, Patty, you've never failed at anything. I fell at a lot, um, but I get up and I learn from it. So um, this was in in Berkeley, um, and it was um, I was a branch manager at the time, fairly new, but um, very well intentioned and, and lots of good energy. We had majority African American community. Um, Berkeley was an interesting city um, that where uh, back in the day, a long time ago, there were covenances um, where um, African Americans and our Japanese Americans could only buy south of Berkeley in terms of housing. And in fact, many Japanese Americans had white friends who bought the property and for them in their name because they couldn't buy property also. So it was an interesting dynamic. As a result, where I served, it was majority people of color. And um you know, African Americans, Japanese Americans, Chinese, Vietnamese, Koreans, there's all a lot of group within Berkeley that are like that. Th yes, there were white people as well, but you had neighbors living right next to each other um, who were all of a different kinds of groups of people. And in fact, um, you know, just, just to give you some context, Malcolm X School was one of the elementary schools and the lunch ladies were all Japanese American and they served bento every day to those children. It was a very different kinds of cultural nuance. Um, but um, being as it may, I was newer to the job. I had um, a community member come in, mom and daughter. She was going to um, college. She was so excited. And I, um, she was very dark skinned. I made incorrectly an assumption and i um i actually brought out um these wonderful books and paul will remember um gail schlachter used to run reference service press and and she's she's now gone from us but they were one of the few tools that we had specifically for different people of different backgrounds um uh scholarship grants all kinds of information it was a beautiful set of, of uh, reference services that we had. And so I brought out, um, uh, uh, I made an assumption that she was African-American and I brought out the tools for African-American 
grants and resources and scholarships. And um, the mother got very angry with me. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought this is what you need. And I should have had a deeper conversation. But I'm telling you what one beautiful thing happened. So I made a big mistake. Um, the daughter, she took my hand. And I when I started to apologize and I said, I'm so sorry, I should have made it. I, I made an assumption and that was incorrect of me. And the daughter took my hand and she said, I don't think you're going to I don't think you're going to recognize who we are, though. And I said, then please, by all means, um, let me know. And um, and she said, I'm I'm part Hawaiian. And I said, beautiful. And so I gave her the 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 reference service tool that physically worked with um, Asian and Pacific Islanders. And later on, I, I did go up to the mother again and the mom said, you know what? I shouldn't have barked at you. <laughs> she said, you're you. She said, if all people in the whole world. And I said, no, no, no. I said, I made an assumption and you were right to call me on it. And um, and she said, um, the reason I bring this up is because the daughter in that moment brought me back in and 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 started to do the healing. She did exactly what I would have expected me to have done myself, right? Which is how do we bring ourselves back in to the conversation when we've um, made a mistake? And how do we admit um, that we've made a mistake? That's part of leadership, being the most vulnerable and is when you can admit mistake. But then if you can actually bring yourself back in and, and um, restore that relationship somehow, um, that's what the daughter was doing. So she was probably the wisest person in the room. And she actually um, taught me so much that day. So what I'm sharing with you is that we all make mistakes. We need to own up to it. Part of leadership is actually being the most vulnerable we can in that moment, admitting you make a mistake, restoring the relationship when you can, um, acknowledging, but acknowledging that you have something to learn all the time. Um, so I, I will tell you the long end of that and the short end of it is that the daughter and the mother came back. They had, they took actually, they copied, I mean, not necessarily that we're all supposed to do this, but they copied every single page that referred to her. She got a full ride. Now that is back in the day when Pacific Islanders didn't actually get a whole lot of money. It wasn't that, you know, it wasn't as recognized right now um, uh, as, as a community that really needs support. And, um, but she got a full ride. Um, she got into Stanford and she came back to tell me that because in that moment, she didn't have anybody else to help her. And her mom had said, we have never, we didn't go to college. We don't know what to do. We have no idea. Um, I will tell you in that relationship, afterwards, you know, after I apologized and after we 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 made up a little bit, I, I introduced her to FAFSA. We talked about her her application. Um, we helped proofread her her um uh her and I would have done that for anybody. It wasn't just because of that um that snafu that I had. But I wanted to share that with you because since then um that has deepened my commitment to the work, especially around bias, because I came with this um, this understanding that that was not true. And instead of actually letting go of it, brave mother too, um, uh, I made an assumption and that was incorrect for me to do. So as you're doing your own reference training and, and, and your development and asking questions, don't be hesitant to ask the question. I know that sometimes they're sensitive, but please, you know, even if you said, um, I'm not sure which of these volumes, I could have brought all five of them out for her to look at and they would have picked the right one. And that would have been a little easier for me, but I did the shorthand and that was incorrect in my assumption. So um, I think it's a long-winded way of saying, um, be honorable in your mistakes and 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 learn from them and um, become a better person. Um, thank you, Paul. So Patty, how can you, you talk about the power of learning and the change that you underwent from learning from your mistake? How can our current future library staff, our library student, our MLIS information science students, anyone who's listening, seek out those experiences to develop those tools that you have 
that they can learn from mistakes and unexpected outcomes. How do you, how do you, how do they take that first step? You know, um, I'm going to share with you um, uh, someone who is very dear to me and has helped me in my own evolution. Um, uh, two things rather. One is um, I want, uh, if you can, take a look at the work of Frank Benest, B-E-N-E-S-T. Um, he writes an article, he writes a, a monthly article um, and set of columns for um, ICMA, which is the International um, City County Managers Association. It's called Career Compass. And if you Google Career Compass and Frank Benest, it'll come right up. It is free to you. And the reason why I do this is because he puts out a very um, uh, kind, sensible, common sense set of articles that deal with HR, dealing with people. Um, and, and he has it. He's written it. He didn't realize it at the first, but he himself practices EDI all the time. And um, and it's written in that perspective. He is a white male. Um, he used to be the city manager at Palo Alto well, well-known um, uh, mentor and coach. And I, I will tell you that it's made a big difference for me. So I pass that on to you. The other thing I would share with you is um, uh, seek a mentor, be a mentor. Um, it is important. Right now I'm mentoring quite a few students and, and actually quite a few librarians um, and sometimes other people outside the library world. I'm, I'm mentoring a few Parks and Rec people now too. Um, the more you practice, so know that learning from mistakes, you have to make some first, you know, I mean, it, remember that there's nothing like experience, but your response to it is something that you need to check. And that's because um, we all come with bias. So I would do that reflective bias work first. One of the things we had all of our staff engage with is strengths finders. Um, I, I, you know, not that you have to do any of these things directly, but I do think that you need to do some good hard work in terms of bias and um, and take a look at, um, you know, there's the Harvard um, bias um, survey. I'm not sure that you want to always do those things because some of them are a little cursory in nature. And I think the work needs to be a little deeper. Mm -hmm. um, but I would suggest that you um, seek a mentor who's gone through um uh, especially in the in the BIPOC world, I would. Um, uh, and and then when you get to be um, of some experience, then you should also choose to be a mentor. I there and remember, mentoring um, requires preparation, and there's cross benefits all the time. But the other thing is, you don't have to be super knowledgeable. Um, uh, years and years and years of experience. There's benefit to to providing support and um, and facilitation and just even asking each other some really good questions. Um, don't be afraid to have that dialogue with others uh, within your classroom experience. Remember that ethics is a part of our um, expectations as a curriculum and the learning within the SJSU iSchool experience. Um, Having that ethics conversation, even if your um, even if your instructor doesn't provide it for you, bring it up, bring it up. It is a very important part of your individual learning as as human beings to have that strong conversation, and it will lead definitely to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Believe me, it's the <laughs> it's the community. It's it's what we find ourselves in today, but it's mm -hmm. always been there. Because um, remember, inclusion means also including everyone. And of course, we don't just mean ethnicity. We're talking about EDI in its broadest sense. Um, you know, one of the things that's hardest, I think, for staff sometimes is that, you know, as a, as a woman of color, you can see that I'm a woman of color. And in fact, I was joking with some other staff on the other day. They said, Patty, people can't always figure out what you are. Um, and I said, that's true, because I'm a little darker. And um, uh, so I have Filipino people come up to me and they speak Tagalog. I have Hmong people come up to me and they're speaking either green Hmong or white Hmong. Um, I um, I have Thai people coming up to me. I welcome all of that. I'm not offended at all. I actually am very apologetic that I'm not who they think I am because, but I tell them that I care and that I understand 
Um, and that I, you know, uh, I work at the library and I'd love to support them in their journey as they, as they, as they learn more about us. Um, but isn't that wonderful that actually people who, whose language normally is not first English who approach me, they see themselves in me. And so even though they're not necessarily Chinese, um, um, I welcome them with, with open arms. And that's actually the other part of the conversation. When people see you, they sometimes make assumptions like mm -hmm. I did in that Berkeley example. Um, what can we do to actually help them understand and be more educated without offense about who I am? Know that all those individuals who came up to me, whether they spoke Tagalog or Hmong or, or Thai or Vietnamese or, or, or another language, they recognize that as a person of color, um, you know, I, I, they made an assumption that I would be more welcoming. And of course they were right in this particular case. Um, know that all of us as individuals within our own frame of community have that responsibility to be that welcoming um, community member who can facilitate that work. You will learn more if you actually are more open to listening and actively learning um, through the engagement we have with our community. Um, please don't wait for your supervisor to tell you that you should do outreach, volunteer. <laughs> Be that brave person who goes to a different community. When mm -hmm. I started off in the library world, I was um, a children's librarian in the heart of East Oakland. And East Oakland at that time was majority African-American, um, uh, so small other groups, Vietnamese. Um, but the days where East Oakland was populated by um, Italians and Germans was long gone. It wasn't that it wasn't that face anymore. And then, of course, part of East Oakland, um, I came to learn about the Fruitvale community. And that was um, a lot of a, a large Latino population. But on my block alone where I lived. There were all Spanish speakers, but they came from about 30 different countries. So wow. that nuance was very important for me to understand and to be able to communicate well. So the learning is lifelong. Um, don't don't hesitate to 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 be part of your the community where 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 you live, whether it's and where you work. So how do you come through so clearly that you were exhilarated by the work you're doing? And at the same time, when you talk about the failures that you you recover from, that sometimes it can really take you down and it can, it can be rough on you and on our peers. What do you do to maintain your own health and wellness in the face of challenges that you uh, that you face in your work? Thank you. Um, I um I do a lot of baking. <laughs> so I bake a lot and I bring the food if I can to work because uh, I don't want to eat it all myself. Um, but um, I take walks, I meditate. Um, I understand also that wellness is not just my own responsibility, but my responsibility also to share with the staff. So that means that I'm always asking, you know, can we at our staff days, can we not just all talk about work, but also focus in on how the staff can um, breathe a little bit, right? So we might have meditation. Sometimes we have yoga. Sometimes in Santa Monica, we had a wellness room and um, we offered it to both staff outside the library too. Um, so it had um, a little coffee bar. It had, you know, little those little relaxing chairs. Sometimes we brought in a, a person who gave massages to staff. Um, uh, you know, and that was all paid by for the friends and the foundation, you know, so we find ways of actually giving the staff a lift. Um, sometimes it's, you know, um, a T-shirt that has the same logo. The last one we did here at Santa Clara said, how can I help you today? Um, and staff wear that with pride. They really love, you know, it's got a little, um, uh, I believe uh, there's a local artist that did um, the logo that uh, and the wrap that goes around our bookmobile. And so we use that all the time as emblematic because it's the, the fun side of, of a lot of the things that we do. Um, and we get ideas from the staff all the time how to make the wellness room better. Um, last time I think our, our wellness activities, um, we usually have some animals to pet. You know, there's nothing like, you know, petting a dog or a cat or, a you know, uh, we've had chickens and rabbits and hamsters and all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, and, and all of those animals, uh, you know, are there for um, sometimes they're there for also adoption and they eventually get adopted, too. So there's there's a 
There's um, caring about the team and getting their feedback and input is really critical um, to the total wellness of the organization um, and being mindful that we save some time for that and make it purposeful. Patty, as we wrap up our time together, yes. what is, well, I'm, I'm going to say for you, one or two things you wish that you knew before you started your journey as a library person? Hmm. Okay. Um, I think when I, um, before I came formally to libraries, so I've always been a library kid, um, but I think what I, um, I did, I did not know exactly what it was like working in a library, how many different kinds of situations you find yourself in where you have to act quickly um, and stop and reflect. So preparedness, I think for any kind of activity, I I will say um, one of the things I also didn't realize is that preparedness would lead me to sometimes being an expert in all things emergency. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've had uh, everything from gas leaks to um, we, we had some altercations with somebody who came in with um, with a knife and a gun and a couple of times. I don't want um, the students to think about that the library is a dangerous place because the library is just like any other public institution. We have different kinds of experiences. What has made me stronger by that ex experience with emergencies though, is not only thinking on my feet, but actually creating an awareness where bringing stability and normalcy back to the um, environment after there's been a shock of some kind is a very important skill. And um, I call it re-entry. <laughs> um, so, some people may call it, you know, continuing operations, right? Um, but it, it, is, it is very important no matter what the emergency is. It could be a disagreement among staff. It could be, um, um, you know, um, a group of kids who might have been rowdy that day and you need to kind of ask them to come back another day. Um, it could be someone who's who's had an accident in the library. You know, all of those things, we need to respond correctly and appropriately. We need to involve other people with us. And, um, uh, you know, we need to be mindful that um, if we can learn from it to avoid it from happening again, or to be a little bit more prepared so we can provide the best service possible. Um, and the other part is no matter what, um, we also have an obligation to making sure that there's as much normalcy for the staff and the community um, as we bring things you know, back up to speed in the way they were before, um, so that everyone has a, has a good experience at the library. Patty, thank you so much for the wonderful insights and for being just so warm and honest with the students and our peers about what you face and what we can be doing in a positive way. Thank you. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And thanks to the San Jose State University High School. And join us next time for the Informational Model Podcast, where we will discuss all things library science. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.